his own life. And so these are obviously very heavy issues that led me interestingly enough into the field of laughter because I started to research how people survive horrible um, traumas and deaths and losses, including the Holocaust is where my research started. And I read Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, where there's a whole passage about how the fact that the people who survived the Holocaust were those that found a way to laugh in community. And that really struck me kind of like at the perfect time when you pick up a book and it's like the perfect passage at the perfect yes. time. And um, it gave me chills and I'm like, okay, I haven't tried that. In 49 years, I haven't laughed or had fun or been playful or silly. I've been quite serious. I've been a professional. I went and got my master's degree. I did the things. I was a good girl. I was a good wife, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, but I actually never figured out how to have fun with myself or, or even with my friends and family. I was in control. Like I was in control all the time. That's and, the operative word, right? Exactly. And I was fine. I was fine. You know, that other operative word because it looked fine. But really, I felt like there was an entire part of myself that wasn't expressed um, mm -hmm. from the side that laughed to the side that understood pleasure, that felt like I deserved pleasure and felt worthy of pleasure um, to the sexuality aspect. So I just it, it broke me open because I had to fall apart, of course, and have a breakthrough, uh, mm -hmm. breakdown before the breakthrough as many of us do. And so in facing my son's death, I found laughter and pleasure. And then I made it my job because I realized it saved my life and his and continues to be my passion and my purpose since then. Because when I was a marriage and family therapist before doing traditional therapy, and then when I went on to be a holistic coach and did the yoga and the meditation, the exercise and all the things, drink your celery juice, drink the water, eat the kale, like it wasn't enough to get me through chronic illness, chronic pain and suicide that that it wasn't going to be enough. So I had to go in the back door for myself. And I realize now with all of my clients now that it's really a wonderful way to survive and thrive through trauma and heartache that we don't often hear about. Like we hear laughter is the best medicine, but we don't actually figure laughter and humor will get us through death, loss, pain, illness, um, tragedies. And I, I see it every day now because that's the yeah. lens I'm seeing it through. Well, you're living it every day. And if yeah. anything, like I love how you're applying all of these things because you've gone on this journey. And this is, mm -hmm. I mean, what you've said is just so eloquent because that's what a lot of women out there, right? I've done this. I, I, I've, I've accomplished, you know, I have a, a practice or I have a, a mm -hmm. career, I have a job, I have the family, I have all these things. And yet there seems like I'm not really having fun. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not really feeling fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And then there's these other aspects you've touched on that people won't bring up. Hey, guess what? One of those fulfillment areas is sex, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. And then people don't talk about whether or not, you know, well, how fulfilling is your relationship that you're in? Um, mm -hmm. Questions of having an open relationship. You know, mm -hmm. I've been in that position too with, you know, a previous marriage. And it was like, because as you're saying, I knew I was bisexual yep. and I, he knew that too. And there was, you know, wasn't a lot going on between us. And I kind of like asked for permission. Well, is it cool to go on the other side, the play on the other team? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Non-monogamous yeah. relationships can work very well as long as there's two consenting or more more consenting adults. Right. But it's not for everybody. It's, it's not, not always. And there there has to be the communication. That is key. And 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 it is a difficult subject to bring up, you know, yeah. because there's so much wrapped around sex, right? Just in and of itself. And then when you're gonna ask for something untraditional. Yeah. You know, um, then there's all these other, you know, you don't even realize all the stuff that comes up, even if you're not religious anymore. I'm a recovering Catholic, but you still mm -hmm. have this stuff in the background that's playing out because you're kind of, sure. is this right? Am I going to be damned? I'm, I'm seeing her asking my husband, is it cool if I go, uh, you know, yeah. with women, you know, and, um, and yet, it's like, I, I still do love you. And I don't want our relationship to end. Um, you know, mm -hmm. so I, I love that you bring all these things in the book. Is it just your stories or there's culmination? Is there not of other people's stories? Yeah, too? I brought in 15 other women um, all along the LGBTQ spectrum from, you know, 
curious to questioning to bi bisexual to trans women. And they're all tell their coming out story. And for some of them, the book was their coming out story. So it was really brave that they did come out this way. Um, for some of them, they talked to their therapists or their spouses and their families long ago. And there is a lot of like religious trauma and religious uh, pain points in the book as well. But um, for most people, it was just the sense of holding on to like, is this okay? Like, am I still, are people, and am I still going to see myself as a, as a, a good person? If this is, if these are my thoughts and I'm trying to reduce the shame about it all, because now that I talk to these women all the time, like I have a hard time I'm now surprised if a woman tells me she isn't bisexual. Like <laughs> even the women in the PTA or the people I see in the grocery store, they're like, did you write that book? I'm like, yeah. And they're like, I've never told anybody this, but I kind of identify with that. I'm like, yeah. I know most people do. So like, let's release the shame about it. I have no evidence to back up my claims. I've been you know, faithful to my husband's. I don't have experience with a woman and that doesn't make me any less bisexual because yeah. I, I don't have to have the experience to have my knowing. And so I think it's okay wherever we land on that. So I did invite 15 other women to join because there's some women who have had a lot more sex than I have that are writing <laughs> very fun um, experiences in this book and some painful ones. Yeah. Um, and so, and ones who have been monogamous and ones who have chose non-monogamy and, um, and, women who have decided that they're not going to say anything to anybody uh, for a very long time because they're waiting for their parents to die or waiting for their children to grow up or fill in the blank. So I did want it to be a compilation of many different perspectives because my perspective, even though I do this, let the pleasure be the measure podcast and talk about sex and sexuality a lot in my own personal life, there's not any, partner nor solo sex going on because I'm parenting a sick kid. <laughs> so I decided I'm just like, my sex is going to be like, I'm having a love affair with myself and I'm falling in love with myself and all of my aspects. And if that includes solo sex, when I have like a rare moment in the bathroom or something by myself, which is very rare, then maybe. But other than that, I'm just like letting that go. I'm saying I can have a life full of pleasure and sensuality by walking outside and wearing colorful clothes and talking to people like you and having conversations that light me up and fuzzy blankets and coffee and coffee and chocolate and coffee and chocolate and coffee and chocolate. 